there's an air of expectancy. For in a very few moments, the car for the 80s will arrive. The new Ford Sierra. Sierra is powerful, fuel efficient, and has extremely low servicing costs. Inside, Sierra is big and spacious, roomier even than a Cortina. Sierra has fully independent suspension and near-perfect 50-50 front-rear weight distribution, which gives superb handling. Sierra is a true driver's car. It's not only exciting to look at, it's exciting to drive. Sierra's distinctive modern style was evolved from hundreds of hours of testing here in the Ford Wind Tunnel. One of the prototypes, Probe 3, was just about the closest anyone has ever come to producing the perfect shape for a practical five-seater car. Sierra mirrors it almost exactly. Sierra is 21% more aerodynamic than the average European car in this class. And at the end of the day, that means it not only looks superb, but it has vastly improved fuel economy. Sierra's engine range enjoys many new technical refinements, which, together with Sierra's outstandingly aerodynamic shape, provide a unique combination of fuel efficiency and performance. For example, at a constant 56 miles per hour, the two-liter Sierra can travel 44.8 miles on just one gallon of petrol and has a top speed of 115 miles per hour. Sierra is a car for the open road. A car for the 80s. A car that people will not only be proud to own, but keen to drive. Sierra. Man and machine. In perfect harmony. OK, let's slow the whole thing down a bit and take a closer, more detailed look at some of the Sierra's most important features. From the outside, it's almost exactly the same overall length as the Cortina, the car it's going to replace. But inside, nothing has been lost. In fact, it's even roomier. Just take a look. There's more leg room, there's more head room, it's wider at the hip and at the shoulder, both in the front and rear seat, so it offers more comfort to the driver and his passengers. But the whole design philosophy behind Sierra has been to create the best possible driving environment, more comfortable, more satisfying, above all more efficient. And central to that idea is this ergonomically planned fascia, with the instruments and the switches laid out in four logical and rational zones. Zone 1, or the primary zone, is right in front of the driver, and here we've got all the vital driving information. Speedometer, fuel gauge, engine temperature, warning lights. Zone 2, or the accessory zone, is just to the right of the eye line, and here we've got switches for rear fog lamps and heated rear window, plus other optional extras. Zone 3 is the information zone, just to the left of the eye line, and depending on the model, we've got an electric clock and some auxiliary warning lights. And finally, there's zone four, a lower console, with in-car entertainment, the ashtray, the cigar or cigarette lighter, and the heater fan switch. But perhaps the most obvious change is that the entire fascia has been smoothly curved around the driver. It makes it easy to get at things on this left-hand side, and it feels right. In fact, it's got a nice wraparound feel. Then the other controls, the wipers and the lights, are conventionally mounted on the steering column. Under the bonnet, the Sierra comes with a wide range of engines, wider, in fact, that any competitor can offer, with the emphasis always on fuel efficiency, with lots of power and ease of maintenance, ease of accessibility. All the Sierra petrol engines have brakeless ignition, which brings with it, of course, accuracy and reliability of ignition virtually throughout the vehicle's life. There's also the option of a 2.3-litre diesel engine with outstanding fuel economy, very good performance, it's also quiet, and has the long service life always associated with a diesel engine. 
As for body protection, this super slippery aerodynamic body has been through a first class 20 stage paint and body protection process which should protect it in the toughest conditions. The boot is 6% larger than the Cortina's and with that package shelf out of the way and the back seats down you've got 51.7 cubic feet precisely of usable space. Okay, time to put the Sierra temporarily back under the wraps because we want to carry out a little experiment. Only a few members of the public have seen the Sierra so far, so we want to gauge some average driver's reaction to the car. Okay, boys, if you'd like to put the cover on. I'm going to be talking to two owners of competitive cars, an Alpine and an Ambassador, and the user of a fleet car, a Cavalier. I'll ask them what they think about the cars they're driving now, and then get their initial response to the car we've just concealed. Okay, let's start with the Alpine owner, John Waters. Is it your first Alpine? No, it's the second one. I had the first one for three years, and this one I've had for two years. So you're a confirmed Alpine driver? Yes, pretty much so. And what's your job? I'm in data processing. What do you like most, then, about the Alpine, John? Well, with a young family, I like the roominess and the hatchback. Anything else particularly? Yes, the front-wheel drive, electronic ignition, and also the good fuel economy it gives me. What about maintenance? Maintenance? Not too much of a problem. The company pays those bills. What things don't you like about the Alpine? Well, I've had a bit of a problem with reliability with both cars. It's never actually broken down on the road, but it has been in the garage for a good number of days. What about things like headroom? I always find I knock my head when I get out of the Alpine. Even for a tall chap like me, I don't find that too much of a problem. Do you think it's perhaps a little dated now in appearance and a bit tired in trim? Yes, I think it is a bit dated in appearance, but the trim spec does seem to be updated quite regularly and I think today's Alpine does seem to be a fairly good bargain. Mike Farrow, you are the ambassador. Is it your own car? A uh, nice no, company car. But you chose it? I chose it in preference to competition, yes. And what's your job, Mike? I'm an accountant. Travel much? Uh, only to and from work, basically. So what do you like most about the ambassador? Um, I like the front wheel drive, I like the handling, I like the, uh, the hatchback, and uh, I like the, um, the, the general comfort of the car. It's very comfortable on the road, isn't it? It's very comfortable on the road, yes. What don't you like about it? Um, I'm not very impressed with the fuel consumption to date, and I have had a lot of trouble in, in parking it, particularly in reversing into gaps, where I can't actually determine where the rear end is. <laughs> what, about, what about the, the uh, whistle on that Saginaw pump? Um, that, I'm told that that's normal, and it doesn't really worry me too much. Do you think it's a bit dated down appearance? Um, it could be, could be, the wedge shape probably is going out with the round um, this coming on in new cars, yes. Roy Jackson, you own the Cavalier GLS, is that right? Well, it's a company car, but it's for my own personal use. Didn't you own a Cortina before this? That's right, two previously. So what made you switch to the Cavalier? I like the lines better than the uh, Cortina. I also like the hatchback feature. Um, a vast improvement from the boot point of view. I think the instrumentation is far superior on the Cavalier to the Cortina. What uh, about the performance? The performance is roughly the same. Um, I think one of the beauties of the Cavalier is the electric fan. In traffic, I drive in traffic considerably, and I find that I don't start getting worried about temperatures. The electric fan copes very well with it. Anything you don't like about it? Uh, about the only thing I can think of is the, the radio, which uh, there's no accessory position on the ignition key, so the radio is manually controlled and uh, you can forget to switch it off, but basically it's a perfect car. You sound pretty positive. Absolutely. Since its launch 12 months ago, Cavalier has carved for itself a considerable slice of the fleet car market. But how does the Cavalier compare with Sierra? Well, for a start, the Sierra has a more aerodynamic design. It looks forward to the future. By contrast, the Cavalier's styling is firmly traditional, both outside and in. You can see that with the instrumentation, the overall finish, and the trim. Inside, the Sierra has more headroom, more shoulder room, more usable load space, over 51 cubic feet, compared to the Cavalier's 42.9. Sierra has fully independent rear suspension to give a more comfortable ride, it has a tighter turning circle, more positive steering. So all in all, it handles markedly better than the Cavalier. The Cavalier has two body options, saloon and hatchback. Sierra has the increased versatility of hatchback and the estate body. The 
Cavalier has a choice of three different engines, the Sierra has five. The Cavalier has a five-speed gearbox only on the 1.6 model. Sierra has a five-speed box available on all engines from 1.6 to 2.3 litres. And finally, there's the overall performance factor. With its handling, and acceleration and its power, the Sierra is a great car to drive. But the Cavalier, of course, is not the Sierra's only rival in the marketplace. In the UK, there's the Leyland Vital and the Talbot Solara. From Europe, there's the Renault 18, the Volkswagen Passat and the Audi 80. And from Japan, the Datsun Bluebird and the Mazda 626. So let's take a look at some of these cars more closely and compare them to the Sierra. The Ital is basically a slightly redesigned marina. It has all the same deficiencies. It's extremely dated in appearance. The internal dimensions and the standard of the interior fittings just don't match up to the Sierra. The handling and road holding are particularly uninspiring. And of course, the Ital doesn't have the hatchback. However, recent price reductions clearly indicate that this is already on the way out from the BL range. Talbot Solara is basically a booted version of the Alpine, with 1.3 and 1.6 engines only. And like the Alpine, it has less interior space than Sierra, particularly in the back. The performance and fuel economy of the Solara 1.6 are also disappointing in comparison to the Sierra. From France, there's the Renault 18. Initially, because of an aggressive marketing campaign, the 18 enjoyed some success as a fleet car, and it comes with a wide range of engines from 1.4 to 2.1 litres. But compared to the new Sierra, it has a number of shortcomings. The handling is ponderous, with lots of understeer, and inside there's limited passenger space, particularly cramped in the back. The car's heating and ventilation system is poor, with no centre vents. And of course the Renault 18 has no hatchback option, greatly reducing its versatility as a fleet car. In Germany, there are two challenges to Sierra, the Audi 80 and the Volkswagen Passat. The Audi competes really against the Sierra Gear and GL models. It's a car that's undoubtedly well engineered and very stylish. The outside dimensions are similar to Sierra's, but interior space is inadequate. But the Audi 80 comes in saloon form only, and of course, it's very pricey. Also from Germany, there's the Volkswagen Passat, a front-wheel drive hatchback with an estate option. The Passat is undoubtedly well engineered with a nicely thought out interior, but its good engine performance isn't entirely matched by its fuel economy. The Passat also hasn't got as much load space, and its basic specification doesn't match Sierra's. OK, now for the Japanese competitors, the Datsun Bluebird and the Mazda 626. Japanese styling appears dated, even when it tries to copy European design. They're well equipped, but again, the interior designs let them down. Both the Datsun and the Mazda dashboard layout looks pretty cheap and old-fashioned and neither car comes as a hatchback. So that's some of the competition Sierra will face. But the Ford aim is to leave all that competition standing. Let's not go to the second stage of this experiment. Let's reveal to these three average drivers, all of course driving competitive cars, the new Sierra. should suit most people. Yeah, I mean, my, my wife's got very short legs and uh, she does have trouble on some cars. I don't think she would on this. Uh, I like the way they set flat in the, in the panel. That's rather impressive. And I assume they illuminate quite well. Certainly sitting inside the car, it doesn't look overbearing at all. Headroom, yes, plenty of headroom. That, again, is sometimes a problem with some other cars. I'll tell you what, look, you, you go on looking at it, open the doors and open the boot and so on. I'm going to try the back. Let's, let's leave John and Mike and Roy looking at the Sierra. Um, we'll all give them, give them all a chance to test drive it. 
and come back to them later to have a rather more considered view of the car. Meanwhile, let us go away and have a very considered look at the entire Sierra range. These are the cars that Ford believes will extend their domination of the market well into the 80s. Let's start with the lead-in model. It has all the fundamental design features, of course, aerodynamic styling, independent rear suspension. It comes with a 1.3 and a 1.6 litre petrol engine or a 2.3 litre diesel engine. It's got grey polycarbonate impact resist bumpers, a grey louvered grille, steel styled road wheels, these repeat side indicators, laminated front windscreen, all the fixed windows are direct glaze to give a better aerodynamic performance. At the rear end, we've got a heated rear window, rear fog lamps, and a push button boot. Inside, we've got molded color keyed trim to the doors, color keyed that is to match the seats, armrest front and rear, anti-thief locks. The seats, front seats are fully reclining, done in a Windsor fabric. Instruments, well, we've got flick wipe, electric washer standard, and illuminated heater controls. So that's the leading model very highly specified, offered at a very competitive price. Let's now go to the L version. On the L model, we've got the same engine range, a body-coloured grille, these very distinctively styled wheel covers, which have a double vent, flush fitting to reduce drag, of course, body side protection mouldings, and a rear view mirror on the passenger door. Inside, we've got the attractive Bristol and Sanford trim with matching door panels, adjustable headrests on the front seats. The back seat comes down in 60, 40 sections. Very useful, that. We've now got an electric clock and a push-button radio. On the GL model, we've got an engine change, 1.6 and 2-litre petrol engines, as well as the 2.3-litre diesel. We've got a colour tone bumper, that's brown, to go with the beige, and halogen headlamps. Inside the GL, there's Chelsea trim. The driver's seat now has adjustable lumbar support. There's a cut pile carpet on the floor. In the rear seat, there's now a centre armrest and extra support at the sides. The driver's mirror is now adjustable from inside the car. There's also an electronic warning display telling the driver about fuel level, oil and coolant levels, washer fluid level, and brake pad wear. The gear is clearly at the top of the range, and they've added all sorts of features to mark it out as that. There is, for example, this distinctive, very smooth-looking front-end styling, the integrally moulded overriders, the integral fog and driving lamps, Tinted windows all round, glass sunroof that tilts and slides, electrically heated and operated rear view mirrors, and electric aerial. Inside, they've really gone to town with this very smooth crushed velour and Chatsworth trim. The front seats have adjustable lumbar supports, the rear seats have head restraints, and the driver's seat is height adjustable. As for instrumentation, we've now got a tachometer. We've got a very neat graphic display here which tells you when a bulb is gone, a door's open, and it's also giving you an outside temperature reading so you know when there's ice about. We've also got a very upmarket uh, stereo radio cassette player with four speakers and a little joystick control. A very luxurious car, this. Well, we've seen four cars, but in fact, all these models come in an estate version. That's the most distinctive feature about the estate car is this full-depth wraparound tailgate, which opens to give you this low, flat loading platform. Rear seats fold down. You've got uh, wider tyres, 175 mil, a beefed-up suspension to take heavier loads in the gear that is self-leveling. In fact, a very versatile business and family car because you've got a six-foot loading length and 69.3 cubic feet of usable space. But we still haven't seen the entire Sierra range. There's one car we haven't seen yet. ultimate Sierra. The Sierra XR4, 0 to 60 in 8.5 seconds, a top speed of 127 miles an hour. This distinctive and exciting car will be available in early 1983. Okay, gentlemen, you all had a good look at the car and you slammed the doors and kicked the tires. You've had a test drive. Let's get some rather more considered views. Roy, what do you think about the appearance? I think it's excellent. It's my appearance. I really like the style of it. Do you like the front end? I like the front end very much. Uh, that's the big attraction, plus the hatchback feature. John, you're a tall man. What about the legroom? The legroom was perfectly adequate, although I think that the thigh support on the front seats was a bit limited. My instrumentation and the fascia? 
I thought the fascia was very good indeed. It's got all the instruments that I would want and I like the way that uh, the instrumentation was grouped around the driver. OK, let's go to the driving. What about the handling, Roy? I think the handling is excellent. I went to a Cavalier from a Cortina because I felt that the handling was considerably better. I think that you've equaled it. You think the Sierra equals the Cavalier? I do, yes. Mike, would you agree? I thought the handling was as good as um, I found in that type of car. What about engine power and acceleration and so on, Roy? What do you think? I think it's more than adequate for the size of car. Yes, I was quite happy with the performance. Uh, acceleration was um, very good, really. Did you give it the gun? Uh, yes, certainly did. I, I touched 70 miles an hour uh, very quickly, and I was quite happy with it at that. I cornered at ran just over 60, and it held very well to the road. Yes. John, what did you think? I thought there was quite a lot of acceleration there. Quite impressed. Yes, good. Mike? Yes, I thought there was plenty of power there and uh, found acceleration quite, quite adequate. And I think it's always been a good point with Ford's acceleration of their cars. And you think this uh, comes up to the Ford standard? I think it comes up to the Ford standard very well. OK, what about the $64,000 question? Would you buy one, Mike? I would certainly consider it if the price was right. <laughs> John? <laughs> yes, I'd certainly consider it. Roy, you're the confirmed Cavalier man. Would you buy a Sierra? I would now have a very hard job to choose between the Cavalier and the Sierra. Um, I'm very impressed and um, subject to seeing possibly the gear model, which would be equivalent to mine, and I understand there's a lot more features than the model we've seen today, I uh, could well swing it in its favour. There's really only one way, of course, to get to grips with the qualities this car has to offer, and that's to drive it. Because when you're driving, you can really appreciate the amount of space in here. You can take up a good, comfortable, relaxed, driving position, lots of support in the back and on the side of the thighs here, first class visibility over the bonnet because it's raked of course, handling, well they've really gone to town, that front rear wheel balance gives it lots of stability, really goes where you point it, you can wind it into a turn and it goes around on rails, power, well it comes on smoothly just when you want it give it that nice uh, sporty feel which of course is enhanced by this short uh, little molded gear stick here so if you've got the family with you you can get them in with ease and comfort if you're on your own you've got all the power you want for a stimulating drive and wherever this car goes I'm sure it's gonna make people's heads turn however it goes without saying no matter how good Sierra is it won't sell itself if Sierra is to take over where Cortina left off and even surpass Cortina's sales, there's a lot of tough selling to be done in a market that's more competitive than ever. As for the supply situation, the Sierra is ready to go. Already thousands of them are being lined up, ready to be sent out onto the market. Ford has the product, Sierra, a car for the 80s. A car for the open road. Man and machine in perfect harmony.